Conference where England have won the World Cup. And it's the fourth time they've done that. And what a match this was at the Lord's home of cricket. That, of course, was the moment that England women won the World Cup back in 2017. It was a special time for cricket in this country, but also a special time for me. That was the first game I took my daughter to. She was almost six years old then, and she'd only lasted a couple of hours before she got tired and we had to go home. But she dressed up for the occasion, she put on her best Elsa dress of course, and she waved her four and six card with maximum enthusiasm. Two years and two months on from that, she's now eight years old and playing for her local club. But does her progress match the women's game as a whole? From the presumed foundations a World Cup win could lay, how solid is the women's game today? I'm Tim Part, this is The Broken Wicket, let's find out. Broken Wicket. There's a lot going on in the women's game at the moment. The recent loss to Australia in the Ashes series, the changes to the basic structure of the game that are on their way next summer, not to mention the challenges that elite women's sport as a whole faces, not just limited to cricket. To help us unpick this, I've spoken to some experts at the sharp end of the women's game. Hi, I'm Raf Nicholson. I'm the editor of CricketHer.com and I'm a women's cricket historian and journalist. I'm Richard Clark. Uh, I was the person behind the first Women's County Cricket Day this year. Hi, I'm Katie Levick. Um, I'm a leg spin bowler for Yorkshire County Cricket Club and the Yorkshire Diamonds. So the World Cup was meant to be a springboard to a halcyon period for the women's game. But is that just lazy thinking? What do our experts think about the legacy or lack of it that the World Cup win provided? I think it's really difficult because um, whenever you win a tournament, um, people then start talking about the legacy of that, don't they? But actually, um, all the ECB or all the England team were trying to do was win the World Cup. Uh, and then, and to then say, oh well, the aim was to, you know, get however many thousand more women and girls participating in cricket. Well, that would have been a nice, perhaps, side effect, um, but that wasn't really the England women's responsibility to think about. Maybe um, in terms of that, that's possibly more up to the ECB's kind of schemes to um, sort of invest more in the in the grassroots structure I guess um, and there have been these schemes haven't there so we hear about all-stars cricket and we hear about women's softball cricket um, both schemes which I understand have been fairly successful actually um, in terms of getting people along but it's whether um, girls and women then stay in the game after they have a one-off experience and I suppose that's what I mean when I talk about overinflated participation figures is if a woman or a girl is having one experience of cricket in a year, then she counts as somebody um, who is experiencing cricket. But do, do they? It, does that really count as? Um, will that really kind of contribute to the longevity of the sport? I suppose. A World Cup win, of course, has the potential to be transformative, but it can't operate in isolation. A legacy doesn't just happen. There must be plans in place to make the most of the success at both ends of the game. That means converting new interest into participation at grassroots and making the success at the professional end of the game repeatable and sustainable. You're, you're building a whole game from a relatively small base. And what you've got to think about is that, and we've talked about this with England this summer, that with maybe we're five, ten, however many years you want to put it behind Australia in terms of the structure. And, and that's the structure at what you might call the highest professional or semi-professional level below international cricket. Um, now, if you're going to build that structure and improve that so that we have a stronger England women's team, where do the players come from? You can't magic them out of nowhere. Um, so what you've got to look at is development. And if we are five or ten years behind, then you've got to accept that it's going to take five or ten years to build that. The encouraging thing for me is that all-stars cricket 
seems to be appealing as much to girls as boys. But that's only five year olds. They're a long way off playing county cricket or regional cricket or 100 cricket or international cricket. But schools, uh, girls cricket is growing. Um, and they're two encouraging things. And you couple that with the impact of the 2017 World Cup in terms of putting cricket in front of girls and saying, this is something you can do and this is something you can aspire to, then yes, I do think the 2017 World Cup was important and can have an impact, but you're not going to see that yet. Um, in terms of growing the existing domestic game and being a base for English, the England women's team to build on, probably not. And that comes down to funding, it comes down to structure, it comes down to um, the cricket that the women play because um, county cricket, uh, the, the, the KSL is a good standard because you've got the good foreign players in there, but it lasts three or four weeks. You've got 10 or 11 or 12 matches, depending on how well you do. Um, and the rest of the time, the players are playing either in the Loughborough Academy, uh, the setup there, or they're playing county cricket, uh, which is a mixed standard. Division one is a fairly strong standard, but you're playing against non international players. Um, and I think. I think you've got to look at the overall structure and say, maybe it hasn't pushed things on, but maybe it was never going to do that, given what, what it's building on. So the jury's out on whether the 2017 World Cup has delivered on its promise. Regardless of that, there are still plenty of barriers to getting new players into the game, barriers which are a feature of women's sport in general, as much as they are specific to cricket. Um, well, I, I still think that there's um, a cultural problem in terms of women's sports generally. Um, as I say, kind of being a historian, that's been a lot of what I've looked at is um, the barriers that women have faced historically in terms of trying to carve out a space um, in sports that have traditionally been male dominated, like cricket, like football, like rugby, um, being kind of the, the obvious three. Um, and you know, we, we have made a lot of progress in terms of overcoming some of those attitudes and the kind of conservative um, ideas about those sports not being suitable for women and for girls. But I still think that, um, you know, those kind of ideas about what's suitable um, for women and girls take a long time to, to, to go away fully. Uh, and um, I still think that there are cricket clubs in this country that are unwelcoming environments for women um, and that it would it does sometimes take courage and it does sometimes you know require um, kind of brave and pioneering women to sort of break down barriers um, and that that there are so there are still some cultural things I think and I, st I still think that the way in which we view men's and women's cricket is still um, kind of you know fundamentally unequal um even though it's it's really difficult because i think i want to celebrate progress that's been made um such as professionalizing and women but i also want to recognize and i think it's important that we recognize that we've still got a huge um kind of way to go before we hit sort of true equality in terms of even the way that we think about and talk about the men's and women's game so one example would be that um the men's world cup um was played this summer and everyone talked about it as being the World Cup um, and when the Women's World Cup was, was played in England two years ago everyone talks about it as being the Women's World Cup well it's not it's the Women's World Cup and the Men's World Cup or it's or it's the World Cup but it's not it's not both um, and so that's that's something that's so simple um, but uh, you know I think it's just um, one example of the the ways in which we still consider men's cricket to kind of be the default setting if you like um, so there's definitely a, a cultural issue. Um, I also think there's a there's a resource issue, um, and I I do get the impression there are still plenty of people at the ECB um, who think, oh, we've given the women's game plenty of money already, and let's pat them on the heads, and they've had a lovely time, and they've won a World Cup. How nice! Um, and you know, when someone like Mark Robinson comes along and says, oh, we should really actually be investing in the domestic structure. Um, or actually, as coach, it's very difficult for me when I've only got 18 fully professional players in this country compared with 100 in Australia to do my job properly and win the Ashes um, and, and win, you know, beat Australia in World Cup finals. That's very difficult. Um, but people at the ECB, there's still resistance to giving more money to women's cricket, um, particularly beneath the England level, which is where it's absolutely crying out for more investment.
One name keeps on cropping up here. England's conquerors in the Women's Ashes series, Australia. Sport as a whole seems to be much more ingrained in the national psyche over there. That's why players such as Elise Perry and national heroes and superstars down under and the average England women's cricketer can happily pootle around the supermarket without being noticed. Is there anything we can learn from the setup over there in developing women's cricket back here? I just think Australia did it better and did it first. They were already, we might have won the World Cup in 2017, which was a fantastic performance from us. But Australia always had the um, groundwork and implementation at their um, state guilds were getting paid at that stage already. So, and that had been happening for quite a few years. So obviously their strength and depth were just going to get stronger and stronger. And it, I think it just unfortunately showed in the Sasha series um, uh, whereas our international setup, bar a couple of debuts in the most recent World Cup, hasn't really changed personnel in the last five years, I'd say, since central contracts came in. Um, it, 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 you can't really have a professional setup where only 20 or so girls are getting paid. Because the next level down, they're either going to have to make the decision to get a job or they're just going to sort of leave the game. and. I think that's just showed in that the strength in depth that Australia has is due to many girls being able to stay in the game a lot longer than necessarily uh, English ones are, where we have to make a choice a lot sooner. And I think following their model is probably the right thing to do, but we are just a few years behind the ball. Yeah, I think that they're very envious of what Australia have got in terms of they have got this ready-made state structure, haven't they? Um, and with there being only um, kind of a, a much smaller amount of states, um, whereas we've got, um, what is it, 39 counties or something over here. Um, and that makes it very difficult because they haven't got 13, they haven't got enough money to fund 39 um, kind of squads of semi-professional female cricketers. Um, so they're trying, yeah, I do think that they are trying to imitate partly what Australia have done. Um, and that is, I suppose that is a bit of a concern because we kind of want to be doing our own thing, don't we? And, um, and working with the structure that we already have. Um, and what happens, what will happen now is that you'll have lots of overlap between some people doing stuff for county, some people doing stuff for the centres. Um, you know, when they introduced the Kia Super League, the idea was that it would be this new structure that was separate from the counties. But what's ended up happening is Surrey and Lancashire and Yorkshire have basically run their Kia Super League sides out of their women's county or out of out of the counties. Um, and a lot of the, the squads are, the, are similar, um, particularly for those three. Um, and, um, you know, and they've, they've ended up with the county name being in the Kia Super League name. So it hasn't quite worked in terms of imposing this new structure onto the existing county structure. Um, and, you know, who knows whether the centres of excellence will, will suffer from a similar kind of problem, really, um, in that everything that English cricket's ever known has been based around the counties. We can also learn from other, bigger, more popular sports. We've seen the Women's Football World Cup create a real buzz this year, with England's Lionesses going all the way to the semi-final. Part of that success was down to a generous slice of airtime on the BBC. I asked Raf and Katie whether that's something cricket could and should be aspiring to. Well, I think you've just hit the nail on the head there by mentioning the BBC, haven't you? And that's often, it's so often the elephant in the room when it comes to um, when it comes to cricket and talking about how we can best expand women's cricket. Somebody asked me a couple of years ago, what's the one thing that you would do um, that, you know, to change the current situation for women's cricket? And I said, get it on the BBC. Um, and, and kind of not just... Um, the sort of slightly half-arsed way, if I can term it that, as, as um, in terms of the the way the women's hundred seems to be being touted as oh, it's it's women's cricket's great chance to get back on the BBC. Well, you've got maybe I think that, that the BBC have said yeah they're, they're going to show the hunt the final of the women's hundred. Um, other than that, we don't really know. But if you can't follow the whole competition, then um, that's really difficult to attract a new audience and attract new fans if you've got you know two hours of women's cricket every year on the BBC, that's that's nowhere near good enough. Um, and so I do think that um, if if the ECB really need to see that, um, the popularity 
and the success of the Women's Football World Cup this summer as a wake-up call. Um, you know, I suppose probably for, for men's cricket as well, but, um, you know, you asked me about, we're talking specifically about women's cricket. Um, it's a wake-up call in terms of if you want more exposure, that's how you're going to get it. I think there is still an opportunity and a threat at the same time in terms of women's cricket kind of competing with other women's sports to attract the best athletes um, and that's something again that's been talked a lot this summer about um, how do we get the best kind of young because often you know young girls are choosing between sports aren't they and um, how do we make cricket a more attractive option and I think um, you know five years ago when the ECB introduced those professional contracts for the England women's team one of the big things about it one of the most exciting things about it was it was the first um, kind of set of professional cricketers um, but also the be- I think that then they were the best paid um, women's sports team in England and possibly even anywhere in the world um, and so that was really setting a benchmark for where we wanted women's cricket to be we wanted young girls to kind of be looking at that and going right you know um, I'm going to choose cricket and I do think that in the interim um, many other sports have introduced professionalisation um, and have kind of introduced pay rises for their players um, and have actually kind of caught up with cricket to some extent. Yeah, I think the Lionesses was a perfect example of play on a free to air platform where anyone can access it and they will access it. The viewing figures were like the highest viewed things on TV of the year and it's not so much as oh, I want to watch women's sport. It's more like, I want to watch football. What football is accessible to me? Oh, the Lionesses are on. I think that can only be the same for any sport. I'll watch any sport going. I don't care who's playing it, if I enjoy that sport. So, obviously, giving the women more of a platform, like the Super League being a few games um, televised. I think streaming's really helping um, because people want to watch it. If you like cricket and you can watch it any day of the year by whatever format, you probably will watch it. So I think the way that the Lionesses went about it, the Netball World Cup, um, it's just about making sure that it's accessible one and make sure people know about it because they will then go and support it. We're just a, a pretty much a nation that loves sport. Cricket will be back on TV next year. Some of the new 100 format and several international games will be shown back on free-to-air television. However, the 100 will not be aligned with the traditional counties, instead being contested by eight women's teams. We know that this is causing a lot of debate in the men's game, but how is it going to affect the women's game? I think it's definitely a step in the right direction um, because it will create initially, um, we think, semi-professional female cricketers at these eight regional centres of excellence. Um, So there will be this new level below England where you have women who are being um, paid to play, although they, as far as I understand it, they will also be doing other things. So they won't initially be fully professional, um, but perhaps that will that will come. Hopefully that will come at some point down the line. Um, so I definitely think it, it's a positive move. Um, there are a couple of things that concern me about it. And one of them is um, that I think it's been it's been done and is being done um, without a great amount of perhaps time and thought um, and it seems to be being rushed in um, because they've suddenly woken up to the fact that they haven't had this investment um, at the grassroots level that they needed to have done Um, and so they are kind of throwing it together um, and thinking right what can we do oh we'll we'll sort of try and mimic Australia by um, putting in this entire new structure because obviously in Australia they have the state system whereas we've got loads of counties so the way the ECB are trying to get around that is by creating these eight new centres um, but it's much more complicated when you can't just run it through your existing county structures um, so I think that's a bit that's almost they've made it more complicated for themselves by not going through the existing county structures by they're trying to establish these entirely new centres um, to open them up I think they're, they're meant to be opening in October then they've got to recruit their directors of women's cricket they've got to recruit their coaches all the staff that sit beneath that your s staff etc 
Um, and then they've got to decide how they're going to select the players for that. And they've got to do all that within the space of a few months before, really, they need to start training for the 2020 season. Um, so I'm not convinced that they've really left themselves with enough time to play with in order to put all that in place in a, in a proper, thoughtful um, and kind of effective way, I suppose. As you'll know, there's been a lot of um, debate and uncertainty about what's going to happen with women's county cricket next year. The latest from the ECB is that there is not going to be a women's uh, county 50 over competition. Uh, for a while, it seemed that there was going to be no county competitions at all. There would be a new regional competition featuring eight teams, which may or may not mirror the teams in the 100. Uh, I think it's important to say that that's a, a totally two totally separate things, um, in essence, although there will be connections, because uh, there is a lot of confusion over what's going to happen next year still. Um, but the ECB seem to have backtracked a little bit. There will now be some county cricket next year, but we understand at this stage that it's going to be T20 only, um, which personally speaking, I think is a little bit disappointing. You know, the women's game, perhaps for obvious reasons, perhaps not, is, is not all fours and sixes. It's not all uh, thrills and spills all the time. And the players, a lot of the players are better suited to 50 over cricket where they can build an innings. Um, so T20 cricket, fine, OK, great. But I'd be happier if there was still 50 over cricket. Um, that said, um, there will be county cricket next year. So it seems as though if we do decide to go ahead, and I'm very keen to if we can, um, that we'll have something to support. So that's more positive than perhaps it looked at one stage. I mean, if we 100% knew what those changes would be, I think I'd be able to give a better comment. Um, I, I think it's they're still being in the dark, just only knowing that it's not going to be the same as it's always been is is the main issue. I mean, obviously, um, money coming into the women's game is always going to be a positive. Um, it's just, I think we're going to be, unfortunate that we are going to lose some girls in the way to make way for, for the younger generation to be able to really benefit um, from added money and structure. Um, but I, I just still are very much a wait and see what happens next year, unfortunately. So obviously not fully knowing the sort of figures you're talking about at the moment, what it will be next year for the girls to play cricket as a profession. Um, but if you're in your education and you just come out of uni and you're in that place uh, where everyone uses, they don't quite know what they want to do. To be able to earn some money playing cricket is obviously the dream and it's going to be ideal for those. The girls, such as my age, getting on to your middle to late 20s who've already sort of made your decisions in life, um, it's not as ideal, um, sort of having your county cricket taken away from you, but um, it's got to be a positive for the future generations. It's just unfortunate. I think we're just probably going to lose a generation as well. Um, I think the format, as much as it's been talked about mostly, is why, what are we doing? It's ruining the game. I think the format's not that different. I think it's still very much just cricket, it's just 20 less balls. Um, I think the changes that it's bringing in, that it's sort of the death of the Super League and where new hubs for women's is a much greater change than it is for the men's, even though it's mostly your men's fans that are getting vocal about how dare you do this. I don't think they actually realise the effect it's having on the women's game in that we've lost our teams and we're having to form these entirely new teams. As much as a, a male cricket fan is a Yorkshire fan and they're saying, I, I won't support the Northern team. They're not realising that for women, the Yorkshire team's gone because of it. Um, so it's, it's hard to comment on what it'll be like until we actually start playing it. I played a couple of um, war games for it. It's very easy format once you start playing. It is still cricket. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how it is, how it goes when the tournament actually gets here and how it is received when it actually starts going. So some cautious optimism there, but is the loss of the existing Super League brands important? After all, with Kia's support, the Super League looks like it's been a great success and a fantastic advert for the women's game. Oh, I think it's it's terrible. Yeah, it's, uh, I think the end of the Super League is, is just... Um, a, a bit of a travesty to be honest um, because over four years a lot of these teams have built up a fan base and I was at the Aegeus Bowl yesterday and you see a sea of orange Southern Vipers shirts um, and so, so Southern Vipers um, you know aren't going to exist in um, three weeks time and um, 
then okay, so the ECB have come up with this new this new team. We'll go and support your new centre of excellence team, whatever that may be called. Hopefully, there'll be a, a bit of a snappier title um, than just centre of excellence. But um, you know, why why would why would your average fan trust that that team will then be around in four years' time? People invest. Um, yeah, I think that the ECB really massively underestimate the um, importance of that fan loyalty and the fact that people, you know, we see it in football around the country, sort of, you know, league football. People care about their team and it doesn't matter how good their team is. They have that loyalty. Um, and so the ECB think that people just care about oh, big names and exciting cricket. Well, no, people care about their team. So I think, yeah, it's, it's a big mistake to keep messing around and reinventing the wheel. Absolutely. You know, cricket doesn't have a limitless uh, kind of bottomless pit of people who are going to suddenly emerge and be a new fan and who are just going to follow women's cricket. I do think that most of the people who follow the women's game also follow the men's game. Um, But at the same time, I do think that women's cricket... um, does provide a more attractive option um, in terms of the environment and the um, the kind of atmosphere at Kia Super League matches does feel more family friendly. Um, and that, for example, when Lord sold out at the, for the World Cup final in 2017, um, it did feel like there were a lot more women and um, kind of families in the crowd and that it was a lot less sort of um, kind of drunk, idiotic men. Um, I don't have a problem with men, but, um, you know, that those, those things often kind of go together in sports crowds um and so i think that's kind of a positive thing and a selling point for the women's game um i don't know i mean you've got the kia super league which has been successful to a point and probably as as successful as it was reasonable to expect it to be um you know uh, western storm uh for example down in taunton um they built a really good fan base they worked really hard down there i think they had a game earlier this week against surrey stars where there were about two thousand people in the ground at taunton now that for midweek i know it's summer holidays but for midweek that's a fantastic crowd um one or two of the other um the other teams perhaps haven't achieved that kind of fan base but it has made an impact and um it's starting from nothing, really. Um, it's, it's been a great competition. Now, that is going and it's going to be replaced, whether you want to call it a like-for-like replacement by the Women's 100, um, which doesn't seem to have been very publicised yet. It's all the talk about the Men's 100, the franchises and the draft that's coming up. Um, the Women's 100 seems to be uh, trailing in its wake a little bit. We've had some of the coaches announced for the Women's 100 teams. Um, it's not clear yet whether there's there's going to be a draft we don't know uh, what the venues will be there's talk of um, teams like Birmingham Phoenix the women's team is going to play at Worcester Uh, I don't know whether that will have uh, much appeal to people who support Worcestershire to support a team called Birmingham for example Um, the Welsh team there's talk of them playing their games at Taunton which obviously is um, is one of the biggest cities in Wales as you'll know Um, so there's a lot up in the air about that. But I, I do think, having said that, that the 100, from the women's perspective, has a, some potential to grow support for the women's game, being aligned with the men's teams. Um, as I've said, you know, the women's game is cheaper to go and watch. It's more conducive to a family to go and watch than spending a fair chunk of money to go and watch a men's game. Uh, if they're standalone fixtures, there tends to be a more shall we say, family-friendly atmosphere at women's matches than you might get at the average T20 or, I'm guessing, at a 100 match. Uh, So I think it can appeal. Below that, we're going to have the regional uh, 50 over and T20 competition, which will be English players only, as I understand, and will also include England contracted players. That's a big difference from the uh, 100 franchises because, of course, they will have overseas players. then that was going to be it, really. There would be centres of excellence aligned uh, and academies aligned to those regional teams. Um, But that would be it. Now, that's where the ECB have relented a little bit and there will still be a county structure for T20 in May next year, as I understand it. Um, So that will give good county players the opportunity in places like Durham or Cornwall or Cumbria uh, places that aren't going to have a hundred or a regional team within easy reach, it'll give them something, uh, some cricket to play rather than having to go back to a what's still a relatively weak. 
club structure, which is what the ECB have recognised, that club cricket doesn't provide a good standard of cricket to, to a lot of good county players to play in. Um, so the structure will change a lot. Uh, there'll be a lot of confusion. I, I don't... I think the 100 has potential. I think the regional teams have potential. Um, in terms of spectators, we shall see. I think it'll be the 100 that will dominate, if anything. Um, and, I, and I hope it does. I'm not... I'm a Worcestershire supporter. I've got no uh, desire to go and watch Birmingham Phoenix men play at Edgbaston. I don't have any faith in, in the format um, replacing T20 as such. Um, and I'm not a Birmingham person. I've no desire to support Birmingham. I'm a Worcestershire supporter. But in terms of the women's competition, it may be not not necessarily all we have, but it may be the best thing we have. And in terms of growing the women's game, I think it has to be supported with some reservations. So while I won't watch a double header fixture at Birmingham, where you've got the women's game followed by the men's game or vice versa, I might go to Derby to watch the Trent Rockets women's team. Um, because I think I think that does have um, the potential to, to grow the women's game that perhaps the case hasn't done. It is positive that investment is coming into the game. There is always a call to make for national governing bodies over whether to prioritise money or reach. Taking Sky's millions has done a lot of good for the game, providing security at grassroots level, but not many people get to watch test cricket behind the paywall. Having millions of viewers watch on a terrestrial channel, such as the BBC or Channel 4, is great for exposure, but that would mean selling the rights below their market value. How do our experts see it? What should investment look like? I think it's the ECB's responsibility to not um, take money from the highest bidder, but to look at the um, best long term option in terms of not being greedy, but actually going right. You know, what is going to mean that that cricket, women's and men's is thriving in 10, 20 years time. And that isn't necessarily just going, oh, well, we'll take all skies millions, um, as has been the approach for the last 10, 15 years. Um, so I think I think it's it's down to the ECB perhaps um, more than than the BBC in that respect. Um, I think in terms of what's in it for the ECB, um, well, <laughs> the biggest investment in women's cricket has come when women's teams are successful. I, I think that's that's really sad, um, and that's. Um, you know that's that's wrong um but that does seem to be the way things work in sport is that if you have a women's team who have won a world cup um who are winning women's ashes series then um that you know it's it's it brings brilliant pr to the governing body everyone's raving at the moment about how wonderful cricket australia are um and you know in fact somebody um somebody interviewed me recently and tried to um get me to criticize cricket australia and i couldn't think of anything to criticize them for um and so I obviously, you know, I'm not sure that I delivered the goods in that interview because obviously as journalists, that's, we're meant to be kind of being, you know, we're not meant to be just heaping praise on people. But, um, you know, so so if the ECB want good PR um, and if they want um, to their team to be winning, then investment, that's what you've got to do. And you've got to have it. As Australia has shown, you've got to have investment. Um in the grassroots level and and um as well as in the and you can't have you can't just have top heavy investment i suppose um we've seen recently that new zealand have just um made a new agreement whereby they are making the first steps towards um a future semi-professional and then a professional women's domestic setup there so in a few years time it could be that the the england end up falling behind new zealand as well as australia um and it's not going to take too long i don't think before india catch on as well um and because i think that they're finally getting it since they got to the World Cup final in 2017, I think there's been a there's been a sea change in um, the kind of views and opinions of women's cricket over there. Um, so it is it is partly about kind of appealing to the competitive spirit um, in the governing body and saying, well, do you want to be winning World Cups? Because if you carry on as you are, you're not going to be.
you mentioned coaching. I think um, that this one of the big things about the Centres of Excellence is going to be that players um, at domestic level will have access to kind of top quality coaching all year round. Whereas at the moment, if you're a women's county cricketer, um, then generally over the off season, you've got very little chance to do any training or have any access to, to coaching. And most women's county coaches um, are kind of part time at best. Um, so it's, it's partly about that. I guess the competition is important as well, because um, if you want to have a genuine um, chance for domestic players to break into the national team, then you need there to be an exciting um, kind of high quality domestic competition um, that provides kind of very competitive opportunities and provides kind of high pressure match moments. So that's important too. And then beneath all that, you've got to have um, a clear pathway structure for a girl who's sort of three or four in the same way that boys are coming into the game at that age who can kind of join a club um, and then join a a county age group program and then work her way through um, and for that to be fully supported as well? Um, I think that's difficult because you're coming into winter time now so you talk about the next six to 12 months they've got to get the regional structure up and running next summer uh, which means the academies and the centres of excellence have got to be established and at the moment there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, concrete there. There seems to be a lot of, uh, this is what we're going to do, this is what will happen, Um, and we've got no concrete evidence of it yet. Now, I'm not saying that's not going to happen, um, but they've got a lot of work to do over the next 12 months, and and they've got to put the 100 in place as well. Uh, I think, ask me that question in six months' time, and we might see more progress made towards that. Um, But hopefully next summer the regional competition that they put in place will see the better players from division two counties because there are i mean there's two or three england players playing in division two counties I, I don't know how good it is for heather knight to be playing against division two county players and i'm not going to disparage anybody please because i've all the cricket, cricket i've watched this summer has been division and two and three cricket and it's been absolutely brilliant um it's fantastic cricket to watch, but does it prepare Heather Knight, Sophia Dunkley, and your shrub soul who are playing that level of cricket to play Australia in ODIs, T20s, and a Test match? I, I suspect it probably doesn't. Um, so that regional competition next year really has got to hit the ground running, so that when we go to Australia for the next Ashes series in whenever it is two two and a half years time, I think it is, we are prepared and we are ready and we've got um, a group of players, some of whom will be the current squad, who are still good players, you know, they've had a bad summer, but they're still good players. Um, Some will probably have moved on and we'll have a new group of players come in. So the five or six players that come into the England squad in between now and then have got to be hardened players uh, with um, technical ability and mentality um, to go and go to Australia and take them on. Good question. Um, I I actually felt that the Super League for the last four years has been a really positive step. Um, I think that's really helped bridge the gap um, from girls that have maybe never had an international chance or um, are still hoping to have an international chance. You get to play on that um, platform with international girls and overseas players and you can see if you can uh, mix it at that level. Um, I do think we need greater support for the women's game and I do think money is needed in that infrastructure i think the ecb just needs to be maybe a bit more um open about what they're going to do i mean the current plans are for girls to go back to it's um rather than the county set up as it is now it's you'll go and play club cricket instead but in the north for example all i can speak on is club cricket has pretty much died like uh northern premier league has four teams left in it and even those struggle to put teams out so it's okay saying we need to go back to club cricket and we're going to put money into it but i think it's so that whole story sort of bolted in that the money was needed a few years ago. Um, so it's just, um, yeah, distributing the money in really in ways that it's needed, but also working with the people that are currently in the game to see where it is best needed, I think. Investment is great, but is it enough? We've heard already that what the game in this country needs is a greater number of full-time professional players. Will this increase the opportunities for female players? Absolutely. Um, I think. So that's why I I sort of talk about the change as being um, a good first step. I think, obviously, it's 
you know, with women's cricket, things change so fast and you can never afford to rest on your laurels. And I do think that that's been the ECB's mistake is they've gone, well, we've introduced professionalism for the England women five years ago. Um, and then we've just sort of sat back and gone, oh, right, well, everything can now crack on and everything's fine. Um, but you can't you can't do that. Um, so this has to be viewed definitely as the kind of the first step on a much longer journey towards creating a fully professional women's domestic structure. And I do think that from the player's perspective, and this is one of the things that worries me, is that they still don't know how much they could be, they're could going to um, possibly be earning or what the time commitment that they are expected to give is going to be. And so you've got players who are working full time at the moment um, who are being asked by their employers, well, what's your cricket going to look like next year? And they don't know the answer. And some of them are just going to be um, unable to participate because they won't be able to give enough notice to their employers. Um, so... You know, even if you have got a flexible employer who's willing to go, okay, well, we'll, you know, you can have a couple of days a week off to go and train or whatever. Um, then, and you know, and a lot of um, kind of current women's county players do work in jobs that um, kind of would fit with that. So they might be doing coaching or they might be working for county cricket clubs in some other capacity. Um, but if they if they can't tell their employer what's what's being expected of them, um, then the employer is obviously much like much much less likely to look favourably on a kind of application for please can I go off and play cricket with 50% of my time um so that's that's really hard actually um so yeah I think that it's the uncertainty at the moment as much as anything that's that's quite worrying uncertainty is no basis on which to run a professional game to tell us more about the challenges here's Katie Levick yeah so I have um, a traditional nine to five um so I go to work like everyone else during the week, but then on the weekends, I'm usually up and down the country putting many a mile on my car, um, playing for uh, your county team. So whereas your male counterparts, that's all they do. Um, we're a bit different in that we have these sort of secret double lives in <laughs> which the weekends are spent entirely on cricket pitches and motorways. Um, and then you're back at your desk Monday at nine. Um, so it's quite taxing. And um, during the season... It gets very full on, um, but you do it ultimately you just love the game. And I've always been lucky that my current employer, who's employed me throughout my time in the Super League, um, took me on knowing that I played cricket in the Super League and therefore did sort of lose me for a month. I still do work throughout that month um, as much as I can, but I'm obviously not ever present like I am during normal um, off season. Um, so I've been lucky in that respect that they um, are very lenient and they try and help me through that. To try and do that for a full season, is that going to work? Um, probably not, and it's whether you actually want that. I mean, I've tried to build a career for three years um, and enjoy playing cricket for the weekend. Um, does having cricket as the main role work for someone who's maybe of my age and um, sort of stage of their career? Um, a lot of the Yorkshire girls are in a similar position. We're not straight out of uni or still in education. We've been building careers. Um, and then now it's sort of, do we potentially take a jump into semi-professional women's cricket or do we just have to, unfortunately, give it up? Especially in the north, um, it's been um, the county cricket calendar the way it's been. You know, um, we play all our county cricket in one block up front. So from May to pretty much July, you play county cricket and then your club season starts. So for all those girls that aren't in the county setup but waiting for the club, are they going to hang around till July, August for the to start playing the cricket? You're going to just naturally lose girls. Um, and I just think the opportunities that haven't been there traditionally, there's no real infrastructure in sort of training or facilities. Like the, the club I'm sort of connected to has moved around grounds and locations and had a few homes. Um, and it's, it's just slowly petered out and the younger girls, aren't necessarily playing club cricket like you'd have to uh, because they're just going straight into county level and then they're getting plenty of cricket that way. Um, so, and then my sort of generation aren't really getting challenged by club cricket. So myself and most of my close friends within the county set up, we all play men's cricket because we find it a better challenge and makes us better cricketers.
we heard a real mixed bag of opinions on the various moving parts of the women's game. But what's the bottom line? There's certainly a lot going on, and Rafa Nicholson certainly sees that there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, yeah, I think from an English perspective, um, it's in a reasonably healthy state, certainly a lot healthier than it was 10 years ago. Um, being a historian, I suppose I always try to put things in perspective um, and kind of compare where we are now with where we were sort of decades ago. Um, we've now got a fully professional England side and we've had that since 2014. That's really positive. Um, I guess underneath that is where some of the um, focus is now kind of turning to, especially in the light of the, the defeat to Australia this summer and a lot of the talk around that has been the fact that there hasn't been the investment beneath the England side that there probably should have been, that a lot of the money's gone into the elite level um, rather than into, say, uh, women's club cricket and women's county cricket. Um, and I suppose another mark of kind of being healthy would be how many women and girls are playing. Uh, and I think that that's, that's actually a little bit difficult um, to comment on kind of accurately because I think that sometimes, um, particularly recently, the ECB have um, either released kind of some maybe overinflated figures um, about participation um, or they um, haven't actually released kind of proper figures about, say, the, the number of women's clubs that there are now compared to how many women's clubs there were sort of five years ago. Um, but certainly talking to people and obviously because of running Cricket Her, I do a lot of covering women's county cricket um, and talk, talking to people who are very involved in women's club cricket um, and the impression at grassroots is actually of a, a bit of a less healthy picture certainly than than five or ten years ago which is a bit of a concern really. As for Katie Levick continuing to ply her trade in two separate walks of life there are certainly upside and downside. Yeah I think I think ultimately putting more money into women's game can only be a positive and um, it might be unfortunate that we but lose a few girls along the way but if it provides girls young girls with an opportunity that I can get paid from this I don't have to just play for England I can play for my county my regional hub and earn a living playing cricket um, that can only be seen as a positive and hopefully inspire a lot of girls to get into the game For Richard Clark, it's about keeping it simple um, I think again I just want to say reflecting on the summer um, as I say I watched Division 2 and Division 3 cricket. I've been to some beautiful grounds, uh, seen some fantastic cricket. Um, the last match I saw this summer was on July the 14th. It was the final match of the Women's County Championship. It had been delayed because of uh, rain abandonment, so it had been rearranged. Unfortunately, it was Somerset against Devon, so a local derby, so it was easy to rearrange in terms of um, logistics. And it was a brilliant match, it was low scoring, Devon scored off the top of my head, no, Somerset batted first, sorry, scored 137 and Devon scored 138 for eight uh, and didn't look like they were going to win and somehow got themselves there. Um, now, cricket is was invented really as a game for the village green. It wasn't invented for mixed mediums, it wasn't invented for fours and sixes and dancing girls and fireworks and loud music. Um, and for me, I won't see a better cricket match than that. I don't care about anything else. Cricket is never better than when you've got two teams well matched, whatever the standard, and you get a good match with a tight finish. Um, and I loved it. It was brilliant. And I hope that next summer, OK, we're only going to have T20 fixtures, but the regional competition will, will have some good tight uh, 50 over games, I hope. And I'm looking forward to more of the same. And I would encourage anybody to if you know there's a local match happening, a women's match, just go and watch. Don't don't expect it to be sixes and fours and, you know, 90 mile an hour bowling. Because if you go expecting that, you, you, you're a fool. It's not going to happen. But enjoy the cricket for what it is. It's a great game to watch. Perhaps the overall question we should be asking is more of a long-term one. The launch of the 100 is immensely exciting for women's cricket, but looking beyond next summer to a time when the shininess has worn off the new format and the new team identities, will the women's game as a whole be any closer to addressing its fundamental challenges? In our eagerness to, rightly, make the women's game the best that it can be, are we doing the game a disservice by tethering it to men's cricket at the professional level? We heard from Richard that there are different aspects of cricket to appreciate when watching a women's game. You should also take a look at Nielsen Sports 2018 report, The Rise of Women's Sports, which shows that women's editions are seen as more progressive, more inspiring and less money-driven. Where I think we find ourselves now with women cricket is at a tipping point. 
The women's game is receiving investment, investment that will drive interest. That in turn will drive greater opportunities to consume content, and that will also in turn drive further sponsorship investment. This sounds like a virtuous circle, and it is. But the thing about virtuous circles is that each section has to be pulling in the same direction for it to work as a whole. So while the next year is a great leap into the unknown for the women's and men's game, we must be crystal clear on what it is we're trying to achieve and the various trade-offs that achieving those goals will involve. In many ways, 2017 and that World Cup win seems like a really long time ago, but the opportunity to build on that success is still very much alive. We all want to see the women's game thrive. We wish it the best of luck. So thanks for listening to this special report of women's cricket and thanks again to our guests, Raph Nicholson, Katie Levick and Richard Clark. I am Tim Part. You can find me on Twitter at Batting Tim. If you're listening to this podcast and you haven't subscribed, please do hit the subscribe button. And if you've enjoyed it, why not leave us a rating and a comment? It really does help us get up the listings. You can follow us on social media too. We are on Twitter at Broken Wicket. We are on Instagram at Broken Wicket. We are on Facebook at Broken Wicket. And on YouTube, The Broken Wicket. So for now, thanks very much for listening again. And we'll be back with you soon. Bye bye. Broken wicket.